Welcome. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I'm Peter Kern, the director of the Global Public Health Program, uh, and I have the great honor of being able to introduce the speakers in our lecture series. This lecture series, the Global Public Health Lecture Series, co-sponsored by the Global Public Health Program uh, and the Institute for Health and Humanities. And tonight we have a uh, really special, well, they're all special. Uh, but tonight's is a particularly special lecture uh, because we have someone here who's quite an expert on the subject, I think nationwide, maybe even globally. She's too modest to admit it, uh, but she ranks right up there with the people who are really uh, familiar with what's going on right now in terms of the global outlook for HIV and AIDS. So let me give the uh, introduction. Uh, Dr. Nancy Fitch is currently independent consultant in international health, working for a newly established firm, the Institute for Collaborative Development, that specializes in health financing and health system engineering. She previously worked for seven years at the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation and the, for the Foundation's Director of Sustainability and Health Systems in three different positions. Most recently, she oversaw efforts to strengthen nationally and locally led HIV and primary health services and systems in 12 African countries. Prior to September 2011, Dr. Fitch served as the country director for the foundation's program in Mozambique, where she oversaw programmatic research and advocacy initiatives. Her areas of technical expertise include HIV prevention, HIV AIDS prevention, care and treatment, family medicine and primary health care, reproductive health, health service delivery, performance-based financing, health system strengthening, and quality improvement. Dr. Fitch first served as the country director for the foundation's Rwanda program before joining the Mozambique office. Previous to her work with the foundation, Dr. Fitch served in various roles at USAID in Rwanda, including HIV AIDS technical advisor and oversaw the first two years of USAID's HIV Rwanda program. She also worked as a primary care advisor to the Ministry of Health in Armenia, strengthening primary health care and developing a family medicine training program and curriculum at the National Medical University. For 11 years, she was right here as director of the University of Montana Student Health Services, and that's where I first got to know her. She received her bachelor's degree in fine art from Brown University, a degree in medicine from Duke University School of Medicine. She completed her residency in family medicine at the University of Minnesota Hospitals. And perhaps most importantly of all, she is today the co-chair of the external advisory committee to the global public health program. So as you can see, Nancy really comes with a uh, long list of accomplishments and contributions and knowledge in this particular area. And so let's join, join me please in welcoming her to the lecture. I'm really glad to be here. This is really fun. So um, I'm a low level independent consultant, AKA retired these days. So it's fun to come back and work with students. I really loved my years here, and I really loved my years overseas. And in some ways, I was very fortunate to be in on the ground level at a huge, enormous uh, health program that the US government was very involved in. And lived in Africa for seven years, lived in Armenia for three years. And then when I first came back from here, kept traveling back and forth like every month to consult. It was really pretty exciting. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the global AIDS epidemic. The last time I gave this talk, I was somewhat, it, it, was, a, it was a paradigm shift for me to realize that college students today don't know much about AIDS and don't think of it as a health problem. Um, and we'll, I think we'll go through it and say why. I think in the history of HIV AIDS, in the U.S. and in developed countries, it's a totally different issue than in 
undeveloped countries, and I think that's part of the issue. I was here at the university. Can you, can you move the screen so we can see what it says at the end? I can't. I think it involves climbing up there and moving the projector, so I apologize. But, and unfortunately, I, may, I put all my stuff to be on the right margin. So if you can't figure it out, I'll, I'll translate for you. But basically, HIV is, an, is a new disease. It's a new disease that basically hit the headlines in the mid-1980s. When I was brand new at the university, I remember seeing the first patients here who, who some of them got sick and died very quickly. It was sort of a overwhel it was a very puzzling and concerning and mysterious infection when it first arrived. It actually came to the U.S. in the 1980s. It wasn't here before. Um, and then I remember in 1985, there was a test for HIV. They isolated the virus and they could diagnose it. And prior to that, it was sort of the gay disease, the you know, homosexual, Haitian, hemophiliac, something else who, who all died of HIV. And then, then we started learning about the disease. And even in the early 90s, when traditional college students were probably just born then, um, that's when they came out with the first medication for HIV. And then by the end of the late 1990s, it, this cocktail called ART, or triple antiretroviral therapy, was developed. And that basically controlled the infection. And people who were sick, who were sick and dying took this medication and basically stopped dying. Now, there are many complications along the way. And we'll get into some of that. But nowadays, I would say it's not a public health crisis anymore in the US, unfortunately. Annie Sondag, one of my uh, colleagues and conspirators, um, will, will admit that it's not being funded and nobody really cares about it anymore, I would think. Uh, do you guys care about HIV anymore? Is it something you know about and worry about? <coughs> nah, I would say not. It's not nearly as, doesn't have nearly as many headlines as opioid crisis or Zika or Ebola or whatever the what disease. Is the, what is the financial cost burden on society for HIV in the US? I mean, that number can tell us whether it's there. Well, I would say there's 50,000 new infections a year approximately, and I'll get to some of that data. But you're right, it's, it's not a real issue. It's just not that common in the US. So certainly in Montana, it's not that common anymore. So it's not a public health crisis, and I don't, I'm not saying you should be worried about it, because it's, we, we have an effective health system, we have medication, people who have the disease are now funded to get treatment, and so it's not an epidemic in the U.S. anymore. But that is totally different, in, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. And basically, the disease started in Africa, and it wasn't really recognized that it was in Africa until it became an epidemic in the U.S. And then, we found out, tracing it back, that, oh, it started in Africa. It's been simmering in Africa for 30 or 40 years, since the 1950s. It had the opportunity to spread and infect a huge amount of the population, or a much larger amount of the population. And in particular, it left the high-risk population, which I'll talk a little bit about, and started infecting women and girls and children. And so it wasn't contained in a small, in, in high-risk subgroups. And the disease itself, well, the disease is really the same in Africa. It's the same globally. The epidemic is quite different in Africa. And you can see, if you look at what the, by prevalence, I mean what percent of the population is actually infected with HIV. It is, um, it was higher than 10 percent. Uh, I forget what year this slide came from. But in southern Africa, that's the epicenter of the epidemic. Now, it actually started in central Africa, and it has spread, and I'll talk about why. But the epidemic has spread quite differently in Africa than it spread in the US. And you can see the progression of HIV in Africa from 1982 to 2005. Basically, it started near where I first worked, near Rwanda. In the great, that's Lake Victoria right there. It started there. And then it has spread really to uh, be concentrated in southern Africa. And the reason, primary, primary reason for that is that there's a huge net migration in Africa of men from middle Africa to southern Africa because South Africa is the economic driver of Africa. And lots of men, 
particular, also women, but more men, migrate to the mines in South Africa where they live in these mines and there's tens of thousands of men working in the mines. They also go to Africa, South Africa for many other reasons. And it's aggravated by the fact that there's not circumcision in Southern Africa as much, but a combination of the migration of men made the, made the spread of it much different. But you can sort of see this huge relentless spread in 20 years so that the prevalence is up in Southern Africa at its worst at about 25 to 30 percent of the population was infected with HIV. That's incredible. That, that's, in the U.S. it's 0.1 percent and it's really restrained to particular high-risk groups. So it's the same disease but a different epidemic. And 60 percent of HIV, of the people infected with HIV are women, um, which never happened in this country. Um, and the social impact was huge. Uh, at, at its worst, hospitals were overflowing and overwhelmed the healthcare system. You would see patients lying in hallways, and something like 25 to 50 percent of all the patients in the hospital were there from HIV. And as a result of it, there was documented like uh, declining school enrollment, enrollment. There was a huge increase of the number of orphans and sick children and families who were already poor were adopting children from the street right and left. Uh, many women were in much more economically vulnerable position and forced into the streets and prostitution. There was clearly a declining workforce. So the, in, the financial impact of HIV was very devastating. And the life expectancy decreased by nearly 20 years. That's huge. Um, and this is just a headline from Lesotho. This poor coffin maker had, was, was losing clients in, the, uh, in about 2010 because the epidemic was finally getting treated. So you could see the ramifications of the disease all over. And Africa, of course, already was, was, is the poorest continent. Um, and life expectancy was already the lowest in Africa. Um, so it had a life expectancy of under 50. This is in 2011, but before HIV epidemic even hit there, uh, it was hurting and the least able to respond to the epidemic of any continent. Um, Africa, for example, has the fewest number of healthcare workers and the weakest health system. This is countries with critical shortage of doctors, nurses, and midwives, and you can see Africa and poor, overpopulous countries in general are the ones who have the least number of healthcare workers able to respond to the epidemic. So what was the global response? Actually, it came, uh, it came basically in 2001 um, after developed countries had, uh, had, turned around, had started to turn around the epidemic, that we now had medication that worked, and yet Africans were still dying. Um, and so finally, it came very slowly initially. WHO founded something called the three by five commitment. No funding attached, but it challenged countries to commit to at least getting five million Africans on HIV treatment. And then in 2003, the US government found, founded PEPFAR, um, which is this HIV program. And then the Global Fund Against AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, which is a multilateral funding mechanism that countries all over the world contribute to. And the, the fight against HIV was actually the largest public health commitment ever in terms of dollars. And it certainly is the U.S. government's largest single disease. So uh, for people who have worked in public health for a while, they, um, they complained that money that used to go into childhood vaccinations or maternal mortality for reduction now is all going to HIV. And there's some legitimacy to that complaint. But you can see what would have happened without this global response. And this is the number of people who are dying annually from HIV. And as a result of the global response, there's been uh, a million less people dying per year. So that had a very tangible and measurable impact very quickly. Now, I'm going to talk about what key populations are. And basically, they're populations who tend to infect more other people. And they, they have been drivers of the epidemic. And um, they're people who have multiple sex partners, unprotected sex, sex workers, 
Um, men who have sex with men, multiple partners having anal sex. Anal sex is a slightly higher risk than, not slightly, definitely higher risk than mm -hmm. vaginal sex. Um, because there tend to be tears and tissue and more blood get, uh, get exchanged and so therefore the disease, the infection can get expanded. It, it can get, the infection gets, more people get infected. Thank you. Um, uncircumcised men are more vulnerable to having the infection and to infecting others because the virus can live in the foreskin of uncircumcised men. Sexual violence is a risk factor in um, in Africa because it, well, in any country, in any, in any country where there is sexual violence because any type of sexual intercourse where there's more blood causes more infection. So if there's any kind of trauma, that, that increases the rate of infection. Um, mothers to babies uh, was a significant issue in Africa because lots of women, uh, because the, the pregnancy rate is much higher, lots of women are pregnant, women get infected at their prime reproductive age or even younger and so they were infecting babies. Um, intravenous drug use is not a huge issue in Africa, but it is an issue and it contributes. And then migrant men, I've talked a bit about that, that migrant men are men who move usually without a family or a steady sex partner, and they're inclined to have more sex partners and they can carry the infection with them. So it's not just men moving to mines in Africa, but truck drivers and other, other migratory populations, particularly men soldiers, for example, prisoners, um, tend to have higher rates of infection as well. The newest group though in, Af in Africa that is most vulnerable to infection or receiving the infection more are young adolescent girls. And they are currently getting infected 14 times the rate of their male counterparts. Um, again, they're just economically the most vulnerable group. They're, they're hungry, they correlated access to food with likelihood of infection, and that does it. And not having food makes you much more at risk of getting infected. Transactional sex, we call, there's a lot of young women in Africa who have sex in exchange for a meal or a gift or a present, and they are. They're not, they wouldn't call themselves a sex worker, but they're clearly at risk for getting HIV. They've shown that if you give young girls uh, school tuition, they're less likely to get HIV and to stay in school. But while the key populations are one group, the face of the epidemic in Africa is often this face because so many children have been infected and so many women are infected. So the key populations, the spreaders of the infection or the core transmitters are different than the large numbers. The largest group of uh, people at risk for each infection are actually wives of men who work in mines. And they're the ones who stay at home. They see their husband once or twice a year. He's had sex with other women. He brings the infection back home. So they're one of the largest preventive groups, how to prevent their infection. So PEPFAR stands for the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. It was George Bush who started it. Um, it also included lots of other participants, ministries of health in the countries infected, uh, lots of global ent health entities, the World Health Organization, the UN AIDS, um, the UN itself. And it's been a serious, what I call a learning effort. It's Barely, it's been serious science and data driven and it's learned as it's gone on. And um, yes, I was on their payroll for a long time, but I think it's really been an impressive effort, global effort. And the result is it has turned the tide, as was the founding language of the HIV epidemic, and I'll show you what I mean by that. And in the countries that uh, were received this program, there's been a significant drop in all cause mortality among adults, so it's had a very tangible, measurable effect. Um, the number of people dying from HIV is dramatically down, and the number of people with new infections is dramatically down. But because less people are dying, because HIV is a lifelong infection, the numbers of people with HIV is actually higher than ever, because people are living. And all those people who are living need medical care to keep getting their medication and so the costs of it are still significant it's not like check it's gone go away hiv is a lifelong infection and the cost of this uh, effort are not yet sustainable by the african countries and so but especially by poor african countries some of the 
most affected countries like South Africa, Botswana, Namibia are classified as higher middle income countries. And they are supporting most of their efforts themselves now. But other countries, Rwanda, Mozambique, which are very poor countries, are absolutely unable to, to support it. And if, if the US and other countries stop supporting it, millions of people would die within a year, probably. <coughs> you can see here, this is just from one area in South Africa. The life expectancy dropped in 2004. It was much lower than what it was after the program started. And this is a hospital in Mozambique, in northern Mozambique, where I worked. And that was a guy I worked with closely with. And you need to see people lined up sitting on the floor, women and children, waiting to get into the clinic to get their medications. <coughs> and again, to show what PEPFAR has done, this is when PEPFAR was started. And it's estimated that 11.3 uh, <coughs> HIV infections have been prevented because of the program. And I'll go through the efforts for that, why they say that. So what is this program doing? What is the combined treatment and prevention of HIV? Annie and I, I call it my conspirator, argue about prevention versus treatment. <laughs> and I'll call on you to give your opinion on this. But um, basically, oh, I'm sorry. Um, that used to be an argument, whether it was treatment or prevention. Do you spend your money giving away condoms or counseling people to change their sexual behavior? But I think the consensus is that Getting people on medication dramatically reduces their infectiousness. And so if you're somebody with HIV and you're on treatment and you take your treatment, you're, you're basically not infectious. Right? I'll never say never, but you're, you're, the likelihood of infecting your partner goes down 99%. So the biggest push has been getting everybody who's infected on treatment. Now, Identifying people with HIV has never been easy because people are asymptomatic for the first 10 years. So they have a sex, they get infected, they might notice a mild head cold, but otherwise life is normal. But you're infectious during that period of time, which is one of the reasons the epidemic was so scary everywhere, because you knew that there was this underwater iceberg of infected people who didn't know they were infected. And that's still the biggest challenge here. But the other things are getting men circumcised. That's been shown to reduce their like their infectiousness by well over 50% if you get men circumcised. Um, nowadays, preventing con infection of children in in, in, in utero um, is dramatically increased by putting their the, the mothers who are HIV positive on treatment. So the treatment, initially when the epidemic started, we just put the sickest people on treatment because drugs were expensive and we, didn't, we couldn't treat everyone. Nowadays, like in the US and in developed countries, everybody who's HIV positive goes on treatment right away, um, including pregnant women, and that will stop the baby from being infected. In fact, the treatment's now so effective, they're recommending uh, preventive uh, ART, um, on high risk groups. So women who are HIV negative, who have uh, husbands who are HIV positive, often put those women on ART just to prevent infection. Um, behavior change and risk reduction still, of course, is very important, but I don't think telling people to not have sex has worked any better in Africa than it has in other countries. Um, I get, there's a huge effort to try and support adolescent girls and young women because they are the most likely, they're the highest risk getting um, infected. And things like education and school tuition does seem to reduce their likelihood. And, and of course, condoms. And uh, that condoms are very important. There's other things that needed to happen to uh, stop the, to treat HIV from. Um, major renovation of health centers, getting running water and electricity in health facilities, phones, computers, all those things. That, I mean, the effort, the African health system in many countries was abysmal. So we spent a lot of money just putting water and electricity and communication and things like that into hospitals. Lots of community education, getting, uh, I would almost say it's more about stigma reduction so that people with HIV were stigmatized and feared, um, empowerment of women, lots of health policy, trying to make sure that people with HIV could overcome financial barriers to, to uh, treatment, 
performance-based financing and had a hopeless bureaucracy where healthcare workers were paid, I mean, even still, doctors are paid under $100 a month to work in many African countries, and so that doesn't motivate them to come and do impossible jobs. Training healthcare workers, training lots of nurses and doctors, lots of research to figure out what works, microfinance, what that means is uh, helping community organizations uh, fund people with HIV AIDS and agricultural communes or activities like that. Lots of support to orphans and vulnerable children and capacity building of governments because basically most of the healthcare systems in Africa are public healthcare systems, not private sector ones. Capacity building to NGOs, journalists, managers, lots of people. This was a hospital that I worked at in Rwanda. This was their sterilization system. It was a big aluminum pot that they built a fire under. So you can imagine in a delivery room when lots of women who are having babies are on tables lined up and they're sharing equipment, the last thing you want to do is share infected um, scissors or knives or scalpels, whatever, from one infected woman to a non-infected woman. So things like that. Improving sterilization systems were important. Annie, this was a hospital we went to. Yeah, I know. In Rwanda. I remember that. And then we had to adapt the treatment for low-income settings because uh, it's not like in America where you have lots of well-paid doctors with lots of who, who actually have a lot of time and lots of staff to treat people. Over there, we had nurses or community health workers now dispensing um, antiretroviral medications for people with HIV. And to do that, you had to have very standardized, simple guidelines of how do you examine the patient, what do you look for, how do you make decisions. And so they were all very simplified. And one treatment regimen, it's this cocktail of drugs that you take. So WHO played the role of developing the treatment guidelines that basically everybody followed. In the US, there really aren't standard treatment guidelines. Doctors will use all sorts of different medications, and that actually contributed to developing resistance of the virus to multiple drugs. So it actually improved um, both treatment and treatment effectiveness by having very standardized guidelines. So the, over the course of it, when, when resources were very limited, you chose the sickest patients first, but now it's actually simplified to say, you test somebody, they're HIV positive, send them to the treatment room, the same visit, they don't have to go home, There's a, you won't even wait to get lab test results, you start your treatment today. Um, and training community health workers to, uh, um, so, so nowadays we have community health workers administer, we'll, we'll refill medications for patients who are stable in the community so they don't have to walk three hours to the clinic to pick it up. Um, and so how do you take HIV testing and antiretroviral therapy into a variety of uh, unsophisticated environments where people are minimally trained and, and, and implement the treatment? So now um, you, can get a, you can get ART when you go in for a prenatal visit or family planning or vaccinations for your child and into community settings as well. So it's been decentralized from the high volume specialized hospitals to small primary care settings in the community. And the goal though remains is um, one of the challenges is identifying um, who are the core transmitters and how do you get them into treatment because if you, you really do need to stop the infection spreading to get on top of this. So ART stands for antiretroviral therapy. Just It's a daily dose of a combination of three different drugs and it will suppress HIV multiplication. It will not eradicate it. So there is no cure. It's a lifelong treatment. You have to take it very conscientiously, same day, same time. If you miss a few days, then the virus starts to replicate, and it will become resistant to the drugs you're on. So really, having good compliance is critical. Again, there's no cure. Um, but it prevents new infections as well as controls the current disease. I loved Africa. There was so much dancing and singing. It was a really fun place to work. This was a clinic I worked in Mozambique. They had 10,000 patients on uh, ART. And you'd go there and it would just it look like chaos, but it actually was fairly organized. And by the end of the day, all those patients would have gotten their treatment. But putting computer, we built that building. We put computers in there to track patients. 
questions anyway. So there's been a huge rapid scale up of people in receiving ART in, since 2003. And sorry, this doesn't go out currently, but the goal by 2020 is to have 30 million people on ART in Africa. So you can see there's just been a very rapid scale up of treatment. And this is the same sort of thing, but it shows by country what the increase has been in people on ART. These are the countries that are most affected. These are African countries. Um, it's what I call fast and not equal progress. This was Rwanda, the first country I worked in. Rwanda, you've probably all heard of the genocide that was there. As a result of the genocide, there's a police state going on now. It's a highly controlled country. They get things done. So they were able to test everyone in the country very rapidly. Some of these countries down here, I suspect this is Nigeria. That's a big country, the biggest country in Africa. It's got a lot of oil. It's actually better off than many countries, but it is totally disorganized. So they haven't done as well. And this is a testing. So before you can diagnose it, you have to test people. Um, last year alone, 76 million people were tested in Africa for HIV. So just scaling up the testing is huge. This is a group of HIV-infected kids kids and teenagers in Mozambique who we worked with. So you don't see many HIV-infected children in the US. It's part of how the epidemic is different. Again, the scale of uh, circumcision. Um, in a continent, I mean, circumcision is very much a cultural or religious sort of belief. It, it, it's something parents do. So changing um, an approach to circumcision is very hard in a continent where there aren't good public health systems, there aren't good education systems. Anyway, that, that has come along quite well. Um, one of the things we did do, you can see that there's been a peak and then a decline in HIV prevalence among the core transmitters who are sex workers often. Again, it's been unequal, but they're clearly measurable persons. How has this all been paid for, you may be asking. Well, the US government is probably the largest HIV funder, and they deserve recognition and credit for that. Um, other countries have contributed in quite a lot of ways, too. They are, as the US started reallocating funds from other health areas into HIV, other countries are funding more of the traditional uh, diseases in low-income countries, such as malaria, tuberculosis, um, diarrhea. But the Global Fund now is becoming a huge um, contributor to HIV funding and to tuberculosis and malaria. And the US does contribute funds to that, but uh, the, the majority of the funds come from other countries. Funding has been pretty flatlined at $6 billion a year since 2009. And I'm hoping that it doesn't get reversed under the current cuts to budgets. Because if it gets reversed, it, all, all our gains will be lost, basically. Um, and there's been real emphasis on cost savings since the budget has gotten flatlined. So um, basically, in the first few years, these are the gains that have gotten made in scale have continued despite flatline funding. And initially, it was because we weren't able to spend all the money available the first few years. But now there's been a lot of effort in how do you make it more efficient? I'll show you some of what, what has happened here. So one of the surprising, not surprising, capitalism will predict this, but as there suddenly was a huge market for ART medications, and um, basically WHO helped with the um, manufacture of new medications by approving um, standards for companies to manufacture drugs outside the US. So most of the drugs for HIV that are used globally are now made in India and some developing countries. They meet current standards, but they had to get waived from FDA guidelines because we require a lot more testing and trials in the US um, of drugs, and they couldn't afford that. So the way to get prices cheap was to um, standardize, uh, was to develop standards and um, let developing countries manufacture them as long as they met quality standards. And you can see that the cost of drugs went from $300 a patient per year down to about 50. Um, 
for the most common line. In the U.S., we're still spending $15,000 a year on drug prices. In Africa, it's about $50 a year per person. And for example, this is just another, another slide. Instead of having stable patients come back in every month or two months, we now have them come back in every six to 12 months, as long as they're stable and they're monitored in the community. And that has dropped the price of treatment significantly. So this is a slide of the number of people living with HIV. And there's been a steady increase in Africa. So the number of total people keeps going up because all these people are not dying anymore. They're living. Um, and so that makes it hard. They still need medical care. That makes it hard to keep all the prices down. So as the budget got flat, flatlined, there, were, there was great debate over what do we do? We can't stop treatment because then the epidemic will come back. But how do we, what's needed to get a handle on these costs? We just can't keep sinking more money into this. So what is needed to control the HIV epidemic? Um, the most important thing is to stop new infections. We can stop new infections, we'll control the epidemic. And so the mantra, the WHO came up with what they call the 90-90-90. We want to identify 90% of HIV infected people and make sure they know whether they're infected or not. So that's been the justification for this massive increase in testing. And then of the people who are HIV, Positive, we need to get them into treatment. So the goal is to get 90% of people who are HIV positive on the treatment. And then we need to make sure that the people on the treatment are taking it properly and have effective blood levels of it. And so the goal is 90-90-90, and we're at the point of measuring it in each country and really by district to see are there hot spots or where is, where is the infection and are those people getting into treatment. Um, the second and third one of these are, have been actually easier to do than the first one, the 90% of making sure that people who are infected know that they're infected, and um, that's been the hardest one to do. This is just the, the frequency, the prevalent HIV incidence, or how many people are getting newly infected. And you can see that has peaked in the late 90s, and it's going down slowly, but it is going down. This is East and Southern Africa. This is the rest of Africa, or West and Central Africa. These are other parts of the world. So you can see it's going down. There clearly has been a change in direction. It was just going up until ART became widely available. Now it's going down. And new infections have clearly declined 51 to 76 percent, but we now look at it not just by country, but by district in countries. So that's a massive amount of tracking of the epidemic. Um, and we had to show that faster scaling up of ART, and that meant how, how rapidly do you spend money now to save money later. But um, this was whether you treat all people or just people, how, how advanced their infection is. But basically, it was shown that the sooner you do it, the sooner you control the epidemic. So there is nothing to be gained by slowing down the investment. The faster we get people on it, the less the epidemic is. And this is just three countries and their progress to 90-90-90. And you can see some countries, these countries, have been looked at in detail. It took a very extensive public health impact assessment in these countries to actually find out where they are in this trajectory. Um, but progress is being made. Um, so the question various governments would want to know is, when can African countries start funding their own HIV response? And you can see this is basically um, total HIV spending per number of people infected country by country. And there are certain countries, Botswana, Namibia, South Africa, Swaziland, or the, and Lesotho are the richer countries in South Africa. And and they're closer to taking over responsibility for it. But most of these other countries are nowhere close to it yet. And just so you know, it's not just Africa. In the District of Columbia, we still have an epidemic of 2.2%. It is primarily combined to high-risk groups um, because there is access to treatment. So again, what is the future here? AIDS is not ending, but we have learned how to control it. 
And without continuing investment and oversight, the epidemic could resurge, and it will come to developed countries if it does resurge. But there is a lot of hope for Africa and, and the world. It's not like they're stalled or stuck. It's been steady progress. But you're looking at the country with the least resources, the continent with the least resources. Ooh, and my microphones are just stepped on. Um, you're looking at the continent with the least resources, where the epidemic got way out of hand before there was a response. And it's just taken a whole lot longer to um, catch up. I'm sorry if I blew the tape here. So that's my formal presentation. I have some other show and tell things if we want. But I maybe, are there questions here at this point? Can I answer? Is the ERP, like, because we've been treating ERP for so long, has there been drug resistant research and something drug resistant? Yes, um, absolutely. The, res the resistance tends to occur when people take it either intermittently or at a lower dose or at a non-therapeutic range. So, um, and that's why that third test, the 90-90-90, to what extent, that's where you actually measure the virus in bloodstreams to see if people are responding. And by and large in Africa, because it's simplified down, there's been a lot less resistance developing than in first world countries where they use a, little, a few drugs. If you have side effects, they switch the drugs. It hasn't been this uniform approach. So the resistance in Africa has actually been less than in many countries. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, what are the side effects? Of the medication? Yeah. Um, yeah, what are the side effects of the medication? They vary. There are things, I, the, the medications have improved a whole lot so that there's less uh, side effects. But for instance, stavidine was an initial drug and it caused a lot of numbness and tingling in hands and feet. So it, it's variable. Some of them cause skin rashes, some of them cause uh, weird body distribution of fat, some of them cause people to just feel crummy. So you can see why people then might not want to take them. Out of yeah. Yeah, but I think we learned through trial and error, and it's come a long way. So it's, it also used to be for each drug, you had, to, you had to take like three pills four times a day, and there'd be three, three drugs. So people were often taking 30 pills a day, which is impossible. So it's, it's simplified, and it's much, now it's one pill that contains all those things once a day. So it's much easier to manage. Peter. So, you know, a few years ago, I, I remember talking to you about this, and you were very concerned about the fact that uh, uh, it would be hard to deliver uh, the uh, treatment if you didn't, given the state of the health systems in Africa. But what I'm hearing today from you is a different story in the, in the sense that it seems like the health systems in Africa are capable now of delivering treatment for HIV um, and AIDS. And what's changed? How is this, how is this miracle happening where all of a sudden um, community workers are doing it and everybody's being successful in, in applying this, what used to be very complicated, as you pointed out, remedies? I think it's been a huge effort where there's been learning along the way. So part of it is simplifying the treatment. So they have simplified it. Part of it is um, building systems to manage it. So I mean, it, it, every, we're pouring $6 billion a year into improving health systems in Africa to deliver this. And where it has been focused, I think it has come a long way and made a difference. So there's been progress both from the HIV perspective of how do you make the treatment simpler and easier to manage. And, um, and I think there's been change in Africa where, where HIV is not a dirty word anymore. People are, there's been enough education so that communities realize that, you know, just because you're HIV positive doesn't mean you're, so I, I think stigma has, has reduced a lot. Um, Health system in Africa still struggle a whole lot, so taking the treatment out of the hospitals has maybe helped a bit and directly to communities. I think um, Africa has also grown financially. There's been, many people don't know this, but um, 
poverty, child mortality, maternal mortality has all improved dramatically in the last 30 years in Africa. The incidence of severe poverty, by severe poverty, the definition of that is living on less than $1.50 a day, has been halved since 1990. And African countries have had economic growth rates of 8% a year in many countries. So Africa has changed a lot, too. It's improving. Um, one of the biggest challenges that I didn't put in the slide right here is that there's a huge uh, population growth in teenagers and young children in Africa. And that's because less children are dying overall from diarrhea and pneumonia from the things they used to die. So Africa has improved as well. Uh, I, I guess this is perhaps a follow-up to uh, what Professor Cohen was asking. Um, in your, I think it was your second or third slide, I was showing prevalence uh, uh, across the continent. Um, there is a gap uh, in, I, I, you know, geography is a little off, I think it was like uh, DRC in Tanzania, Uganda, um, but then it looked like Sudan, right? The, the prevalence is pretty high, and of course, some South Africa is pretty high. Um, do you have any thoughts about what factors are related to that gap? I mean, are, are more Sudanese people traveling to South Africa for mining or, or, or Is this what? your uh, slide? I think it was earlier, before that. They had the, the 2000 by year for, yeah, there we are. So looking at 2005, for instance. I think that, um, OK. Somalia is the one where there's no data available. Sudan is this country here. Sudan. Yeah. So Sudan, well, in general, North Africa is much less affected than Southern Africa. And I think they're just not showing the North African countries here. Um, they're, these are large countries that are very dispersed. Um, and the epidemic, nobody was going there. People were leaving Sudan. I don't know. I can guess, but. But looking at. Um, uh, those uh, prevalence of 16 to 32 in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I don't know which country those are. Sorry. Down here in the southern part. Uh, nope. Uh, north. Um, okay. And then on the other side, Sudan. Sudan's in the middle there. Right. Um, so those two higher prevalence rates on either side of Sudan. What's what's going on with those places in relation to? Uh, South Africa and other Southern African countries? I don't know. Nancy, do you think it could be better surveillance in some of those countries? Like some sure. countries just didn't have good surveillance, so they don't know. They didn't, they didn't have massive testing, HIV testing efforts. I know some countries just didn't do that. They weren't organized enough. And so there might not have been much data from mm -hmm. those countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, these may be subtle differences, too, and it's a changing environment, so I don't know how accurate they were. To, I mean, to get this data, you have to do population-based household survey and draw blood. So that's a difficult thing to do. And if it's a conflict zone, they may not have been doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of like changing gears and talking about prevention. Uh -huh. um, in the, the current you know, population of effects, you're saying women and children, and what prevention efforts or programs have you seen that have been successful or, or in your mind that could be successful in protecting that population? Because so much of it is like men workers coming back and infecting the women in the community, and I've always just think that's so tragic because they don't generally have a say. Right. And so what have you seen around programmatically that works? OK, so for what we call discordant couples, where one partner is infected, usually the man and the women are not, there's been a huge effort to, well, getting men tested and treated has been challenging. So women, are, women use health systems more. So we, we have focused on women. Women come in because they're pregnant. They get tested at that point. So just getting men tested. Um, there's efforts now to put women of husbands who are HIV positive on, on ART, um, steady or intermittent. Um, so for those where, where you know both parts of the couple, that's what's been tried. Getting men into treatment, get, raising men's consciousness, and going ahead and treating women who are 
routinely exposed to the virus. For young girls, if there, there are many studies that show economic support will prevent it. Doctors are, want to give drugs rather than money, but um, you know, uh, keeping girls in school. There's actually been a $350 million effort, $350 million donation by Gates right now, specifically to try and have impact on adolescent girls. And it's all, it's a, it's a smorgasbord of activities from how do you help them socially and economically and politically because they're, they're the most vulnerable people in the population. That really, I think, takes a paradigm shift or a mind shift with the culture. And so does violence against women. So there's, there's, there's community education campaigns. I don't know if there's a magic bullet, though. And so the, I guess the second part of that question is, how do you effectively treat migrant workers? So if you, if you can't you know, be in one place to, to get your daily treatment, do they take that treatment? Like can they self-administer treatment on a daily basis? Or how does that work? Thank you for raising that. Um, one new thing they're doing in HIV testing is now marketing self-testing, so people can do it in the, in the privacy of when and where they want it. Um, but for migrant workers, there are tons of clinics all around those mines at this point, and there's tons of clinics in road stop truck stands um, where you can, they're called one-stop shops, where you drop in and literally get tested and started on medication at that site, as well as evaluated for STDs and tuberculosis and family planning at the same time. So there's a lot of efforts along big truck routes and things to try and address it. It's still challenging, though. Annie. So that issue, I think, is, like you said, like there has to be a whole cultural shift in violence against women and all of that. But I'm, but I'm wondering, interim, you know, PrEP, the drug that prevents HIV, it seems mm -hmm. like the men are not often taking responsibility or not wanting to get tested, maybe not taking their drugs. But PrEP has shown to be really effective in preventing HIV if you're having sex with someone who's HIV positive and not treated. I wonder. Do you, have you heard anything about that? Is there any effort to get women? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I think nowadays it's uh, one of the indications for ART. If, you, if you're in a sexual relationship with somebody who's HIV positive. If it's just intermittent sex, but if you're... If, I mean, there've been, there's been, I think, testing of vaginal contraceptives that have ART in them. And I don't think they've worked terribly well. And female condoms, again, I don't think their acceptability is that high. Peter. You alluded to this, um, Nancy. I'm not sure you can answer, but what's the feeling of people out in the field right now? You've just come back from Rwanda. Um, is there a sense that uh, this current administration will continue to fund PEPFAR and other programs at the level that's necessary, or is there despair? I think there's both. Um, I know USAID is continuing to um, do business as usual until they get the message, until they actually get a budget cut. But I mean, it's hard to predict right now. The government's been funding thing on continuing resolutions short periods of time. There's certainly been threats to chop everything. And the, and the USAID itself is in some chaos because they've had lots of turnover. Senior positions are not filled. Do you get, do you get a sense that there's a uh, commitment at the top or a lack of commitment at the top? I've heard mixed things. I've heard, well, I mean, it's a, I think it's a high level decision, highest level. The president will decide what he funds and what he doesn't fund. Um, but generally, this program has had strong bipartisan support, and it has gotten approved and funding when other programs have not. So they're crossing their fingers. Okay, could we hear Oops, oh, one, one more, more question? And yes. Then we'll have show and tell. Okay. <laughs> well, two questions. Woman behind you. When President Mbeki in South Africa was doing the HIV AIDS denial stuff, what impact does that have? Does it continue to have an impact? You showed South Africa in a pretty favorable light. Um, it was terrible. I was in I was in South Africa at the time, and Mbeki was uh, you know 
denying HIV, thinking it was caused by mosquito, having sex with virgins because that might prevent it. He was, and it would made it extremely difficult to work. Um, Zuma is not doing that, but he's got his share of issues too. South Africa, though, um, it has the largest HIV infection in the world. It had a, a huge job after apartheid of extending high quality medical services to the whole population. Um, they have really led the way in a lot of these developments. I think massive testing of the whole population, building clinics everywhere, and, and they have a stronger health system than most of the other African countries I've worked in. So they're, they're coming. They really are. So it hasn't had a lasting impact? No. No, I mean, it's, South Africa is an interesting, I mean, it's like two countries in one place where you have tremendously poor, um, you know, unempowered population, the black population, and then you have a, f a first world living standard that's higher than the U.S. and then has excellent first class universities. So you have both in there. And since, since the fall of apartheid, they have been making progress. It's mixed. It's a, it's a bit of both. Yeah. There are a lot of production of uh, uh, medication as well in ARTs. And, uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. I'm sorry, I made you wait. Yeah, I mean, I do make a similar line. You know, in this graph, like in this plot, was it like how many uh, patients were diagnosed or, because you said like a lot of the time it takes 10 years to diagnose a patient. This was adult HIV prevalence. So that's what percent of the population is test positive for HIV. So it has to be of people who've tested positive. Yeah, and then we show the feature of the whole world where you know, South Asia has one of the poor infrastructure for uh, health services, but they have one of the least prevalence too, which I kind of find like maybe the data is not there because you don't have enough testing of people from that region. I, I don't think so, because it's certainly, the epidemic is well studied in Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, um, Bangladesh. Those are countries that I have firsthand experience with. They it never really got outside the high risk groups there. So there's a very high prevalence in Thailand for, among sex workers, but they actually now have great clinics set up for um, for treating sex workers specifically. So it resided in some high risk populations. So what did you have in mind for show and tell? Oh, I had that video from past years. Uh, how long is it? It's nine minutes. You want to see it? What's your thing? Um, Can you stay nine minutes? It's a nice video. Right. <laughs> Here we go. Well, well, Nancy's getting that. It's up. ready to go. Next week we're going to have Joe Russell uh, from Flathead County Health Department talk about the Republic of Georgia food safety system. Okay, so it's an interesting different part of the world and different issues, but it's still very interesting for both of us. Today on the continent of Africa, nearly 30 million people have the AIDS virus, including 3 million children under the age of 15. I don't think we knew what hit us. I had one doctor say to me, it's like looking into the face of a dragon. We had patients just shrinking in front of your eyes. People in the prime of their life and, and they're not supposed to die or it's small children. Blood work to find it. There was death, death everywhere. There was a hopelessness amongst our staff and a sense of bewilderment in the community. What is this thing that's hit us? We had no ARPs and there was nothing I could do. To meet a severe and urgent crisis abroad tonight, I propose the emergency plan for AIDS relief. to commit $15 billion over the next five years to turn the tide against AIDS in the most afflicted nations of Africa and the Caribbean.
hardest hit them all in Mozambique, South Africa, Zambia, Cote d'Ivoire, and Tanzania. In those five countries, it's been one of the lead programs that have helped the country roll out treatment, care, and prevention. It was a very bold statement to put a lot of money behind it and really make a very big push. A lot of the other projects before tend to be smaller scale, and here there was really no limit. We thought we probably could get about 35,000 people onto AIDS drugs. Back then, it was the best news ever. Through the project card, their accomplishments are almost epic. They have placed about 550,000 people on life-saving antiretroviral therapy. They counseled and tested about 2.5 million pregnant women, and they provided care and support for about a million patients at over 500 ART sites and over 1,000 PMTCT sites. That was a boom in the number of people that could access treatment, and that made a huge difference. It was a kind of miracle. We saw a patient about to die, survive, and get better, and return to job. Now, we can tell them with the hope that if you follow the instruction to treat them, that you can improve your health and also even prolong, extend your life. Children were always lagging behind, and that was painful. They are the most innocent victims of all these pandemics, and they should, they should have the priority. Just through Project Heart, they have initiated therapy for about 50,000 children, which is extremely difficult in these kinds of situations. It's, it's difficult to take the medicine and take it right and take it on time and take it every day. It's difficult for adults, for children in these kinds of settings, it's really, really challenging. There has been a lot of effort to provide early infant diagnosis because we know that children become sick much more quickly than adults, so we want to be able to identify these children as soon as possible and get them onto life-saving treatment. When a mother finds out that her baby is negative, it's, it's such a blessing, it's such a rewarding time. That's phenomenal that you could give a child a gift of an HIV free life. Preventing the infection to the baby is great, great news. It's not going to help the baby to not get infected if the parents die. We took care of the mother, but before the father. Now we are striving to implement a vibrant family center of care. Now the family is treated under the same roof on the same day, and that helps quite a lot. Many times there is no there for a health system. It may be a clinic with one overworked nurse doing everything, serving many thousands of people. So that system needed to be improved upon. During the past six years, we put in place the foundation. The foundation is skilled care providers. The foundation is laboratories that we equip the foundation is the improvement of the physical infrastructure. We really worked within the existing system. We didn't set up separate clinics. That was hard in the beginning, but it has paid off in all those years because now indeed we can leave the districts and the hospitals continue with the services without us having to be there. The story's been started with Project Heart. 
is not over with, though. The number of new infections per year still remains in the millions. That's our next class, is to try to significantly decrease that. In fact, decrease that by 50% or more. It's not in anybody's interests to stop doing this. It's not in the donor's interests, and it's certainly not in the interests of national government, political leaders, community leaders, and least of all, families and kids. Project Art has been a life-saving program. Currently, about 10% of all the Africans on ART are through programs initiated by Project Art. Oh, just an unimaginable goal and accomplishment. It's been a real privilege to be able to do this. From the bottom of my heart, I want to say thank you to the American people. Thank you for the touch. Thank you to the Project Heart program and to PEPFAR. Thank you, Project Heart. Well, it's propaganda by the project I worked for, but it's well done propaganda. <laughs> This makes me feel good. So thank you all so much. If you have any other questions. Thank you.